All right, everybody, welcome to episode three of Straight Shooter Wrestling Podcast. I'm here with one of my co-hosts, Steve. How you doing, Steve? Oh, buddy, I am excited for today. I hope you had a good week. This is the one I want to talk about. Let's get into it. Let's go. Oh, buddy, I've been racking my brain around this one over the last couple of hours. By the way, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Santi. I'm also one of the co-hosts of Straight Shooter Wrestling Podcast. <laughs> we are on episode three, three of five, three of five. We're getting there. So if you want to continue, you want to see this podcast continue, make your voices heard on the po- uh, on our on our Discord or in the comment section here on YouTube. Do not let this podcast die. I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's my Wednesday night. Please keep it alive. It's all I ask. All right. We're not asking for money. We're asking for interaction. All right. It's not a lot. Okay. No, I agree, Santi. I want to get this done. <laughs> I enjoy our Wednesday night chats. Uh, I enjoy the comments in the YouTube channel. Guys, keep them coming. Don't be shy. Even if you want to troll us and say we don't know what we're talking about, be engaged. Let us know what you want to hear and what you want to see different. Thanks, guys. You're horribly wrong if you think we don't know what we're talking about. But anyways... (laughs) Let's just jump into it. We'll start off, as usual, just chatting real quick about some wrestling news. We won't spend too much time here. I've got a list of things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, We've got a couple of questions here from our viewers, and then we're going to get into the topic of the show. What is our topic of the show, Steve? Today's topic, episode three, straight shoot a wrestling podcast, greatest factions of all time. No particular list. We are just talking about the factions that change the business. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're definitely going to dive deeper into that. Of course, we're going to talk about uh, different factions, but we also I feel like we need to discuss the definition of a faction. I'm sure we'll get to that in, in, once we actually jump into um, into the topic of the show. But Steve, let's start with I mean, it feels like the veil has been lifted a little bit from the Armageddon the doomsday debacle that was last week. We did upload a uh, 15 minute little emergency podcast uh, regarding the WWE releases. Any additional thoughts now that, you know, that the smoke has settled? Ooh, honestly, like it, it's been an interesting week because even recently, uh, PW Insider and a couple other mainstream wrestling news uh, companies have even talked about a possible 10 more releases happening in the coming days. So I was actually going to ask this question to you. Um, what's going on? We've already seen the numbers released for the quarter. WWE has made hundreds of millions what of I dollars. What I tell you, I, I, I don't understand it. It can't be financial. Exactly. So is there a takeover? Because there has been rumors over the last couple of months that WWE could be getting bought by one of these mainstream giants. Um, is there, uh, something else in the business? Are people not easy to work with? There was rumors that Keith Lee was actually very difficult to work with in the back, uh, that we've seen come out from very viable, reliable sources. Um, we've seen the animosity come out from Karrion Cross about the mask, uh, Scarlett Bordeaux come out about not being used and being separated when they were so over as a team. Like, there's been so much that I can't really speak to it. It's just, like, you're really starting to see the nitty-gritty of what's happening on the back end. And even the Nia Jax situation, she apparently requested um, um, time off for mental, mental health. And we know how big mental health is right now in the world. And, you know, getting time to, like, reflect on yourself, take care of yourself and your mind... And she apparently requested an extension and she was supposed to come back to work, I believe, uh, the 15th of this month. And WWE basically sent her, this is what you're going to be working. And she asked for an extension and then boom, released. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that has come out that is very interesting to talk about. What do you think about it? Yeah, let me unpack that. I think I'll give you a quick answer. Um, Like just kind of like straight bullet shoot answers. Um, I do think that they, I I don't think it's a takeover. I think it is a calculated um, move to make themselves as purchasable as possible. Right. And the way that you do that, anybody that runs a business and is trying to sell a business knows that the number like step one, clean up the books, clean up the books. That is the first thing that an auditor is going to look at when they are looking to sell or an organization is coming in to purchase. They're going to look at the books, clean up the books, 
and this is what the books look like in WWE. The only thing that they really have in terms of expenses are obviously like production and talent. Um, you cannot bring down production. Uh, if anything, WWE always seems to increase their production costs. Um, so you got to cut down on talent. And that it, to me, that's just what makes sense. And my understanding um, is that um, this gentleman, the uh, high up executive con uh, in WWE, like this is his expertise. This is his ex expertise, just getting companies ready for buyouts. So, I mean, like, I'm not a genius, but I, I'm starting to see two plus two equals four in this situation. Mm -hmm. To me, it makes yeah. sense. It could be like a NBC Universal, a Viacom. It could be uh, 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 Disney. Who knows? There's a lot of Disney's, players. Disney's been rumored yeah, a lot. In this. Th there's a lot of players. WWE, like, screams Disney, right? Like, if you think about, like, the types of things that Disney has bought recently, when you look at the likes of Star Wars, Star Wars is now just like a giant part of their park. Like, imagine a WWE section. I mean, they have uh, ESPN is part of um, a, a part of Disney. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, you'd have a, an immediate home for WWE on ESPN. Anyways, I digress because that's all uh, guessing and speculation. The Nia Jax situation, uh, I believe that the mental health aspect of thing is just something on her side. My understanding is she wasn't vaccinated. I think that this is the... the the reason she's asking for extensions is because they're demanding that she get vaccinated and she is not getting vaccinated. And I think that's what her extensions were for because she didn't want to get vaccinated. She wanted to see if again, all speculation, but my understanding is that part of the reason she was let go and some other town was let go was because of not getting vaccinated. And it makes sense when you're in a contact sport traveling all over the, all over the world where there are, restrictions border restrictions state line restrictions you can't have talent that isn't vaccinated you just can't you can't operate mm -hmm. that way i'm not going to get into the politics of whether or not you should or should not get vaccinated but if your job tells you you need to get vaccinated and you don't it makes sense that they're going to fire you uh, it just does um but uh yeah no my thoughts are still kind of scatterbrained it's just kind of weird seeing like Monday Night Raw just sort of take place after all of those firings, like how you can just go on about your day. <laughs> there was another one that I found really interesting that um, the the lady, I, I cannot think of her name right now, but the one who actually had to make the decision of, or sorry, make the call to all the talent. This wasn't John Laurinaitis. This was someone else in, uh, in the office. It was a female, can't remember her name, but she was she stepped down from her position the next day and after those 18 were released and now somebody else has moved into that position the the new cfo that was just announced by vince mm -hmm. so the cfo that was before was a female and she was the one and she stepped down immediately after those 18 names were released so it's very 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 interesting what is going on wwe tell us more tell us more now yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you know, like I said, in that little mini pot, like com uh, mini podcast conversation, it's just like it couldn't be financial. I I knew that uh, WWE was going to release financials and I knew that they were going to be amazing. It, this is they're just trying to make themselves um, they're trying to increase, you know, their their price per share so that whoever comes in to purchase them has to just pay more. That's yeah. to me. That's what makes sense. But, you know, who knows who the hell knows at this point? All right, Steve, I'm going to move on. I got some. Kind of interestingly weird and somewhat odd news coming out of WWE. Are you aware of the YouTube channel Up Up Down Down by Xavier Woods, his gaming of channel? Of course I am, yeah. All right. So turns out a lot of people believed that Up Up Down Down was originally started by Xavier Woods. And then when WWE had this problem with talent doing outside of WWE appearances like on Cameo, on Twitch that Xavier Woods actually came to an agreement and sold Up Up Down Down to WWE. And everything that you've been seeing from Up Up Down Down has been under the WWE umbrella. Everybody's been under the WWE payroll that's appeared on Up Up Down Down. Turns out that isn't the case. Turns out Up Up Down Down apparently has always been owned by WWE and that Xavier Woods was contracted for Up Up Down Down from the get-go. If you go watch, look at Up Up Down Down right now, they've uploaded, I believe, twice in the past 30 days. Turns out, even though Xavier Woods is the current king of the ring, he is on a current contract dispute with WWE 
over up, up, down, down, and the money that he's getting paid to be on those videos. There is a current <laughs> up, up, down, down labor dispute. And get this, all of the personalities that were on Up, Up, Down, Down. So Cesaro, Seth Rollins, AJ Styles. It used, it, it was, um, you know, for a long time, the Chugs, AKA Adam Cole. But like all these personalities that were making regular videos with Xavier Woods, they're holding out and refusing to make Up, Up, Down, Down videos until Xavier Woods gets paid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on. This makes no sense to me. Like, okay, if you go back to original up, up, down, down videos, how raw and uncut they were and just so not WWE. He calls himself Austin Creed on there. Exactly. Yeah, so they're, I know. I don't. Okay. By next week, we are going to get more information <laughs> on this topic because my mind is blown right now. I am so confused. But I want to know more because he's calling himself Austin Creed. Um, I do believe there was a couple of episodes where they were uh, uh, referring to Sasha as Mercedes. Yep. And um, uh, Bailey as Beth or whatever her real name is. I'm pretty sure it's Beth. But like I no, we need more information. on yeah. this. We need more on so, this because it was so raw. I know. So my my thought process was okay if this was a wwe project from the ground up is this the greatest kept secret in wwe history everybody thought that austin creed started this youtube channel and not only is it an amazingly kept secret what a great just side project that they decided my under my understanding the news says that um that uh xavier woods pitched the idea of a gaming channel and then WWE started it. Not Xavier Woods starting it and then WWE taking over hostily. Yeah. But yeah, there's a holdout. The entire contract holdout. The entire, the entire cast of Up, Up, Down, Down is refusing to make videos. Wow. I, that is amazing. I need to know more. And like I said, next week we need to talk about this more. This is awesome. I love this. I love that. <laughs> All right, we'll uh, we'll move on here. Last little bit of news, my friend. It's been now, I believe, nine days since Bray Wyatt's non compete clause has come to an end. When mm -hmm. the hell are we getting Bray Wyatt, and where is he going? So I was reading actually today um, that Bray Wyatt is not at this moment in time going to do any wrestling appearances he is currently in hollywood um with i believe a friend of his and one of the key character development developers of his and they're actually doing a movie around one of his characters we're not looking at the fiend we're not looking at the bray wyatt character we're looking at something along the lines um i've heard something along the lines of a blend between the fiend and a very vile husky harris um so that's all i've heard but at this moment in time there's nothing saying that the fiend is going to be wrestling anytime soon they are working on a uh feature pro uh feature project yeah so like i heard about that as well so what's interesting is whatever project he's working on it's got to be large and here's mm -hmm. my here's my reasoning it's got to be large in the sense that it's a giant time time sink into a potential to make a lot of money for bray wyatt aka maybe a movie a direct to dvd movie or i i doubt he would get a deal for a, a theatrical release for anything uh yeah. this yeah um if it was a wwe productions movie kind of like uh see no evil with kane maybe um yeah. because this man Come midnight, November 1st, would have been getting fat check offers left, right, and center. And the fact that we aren't seeing him in anything tells me that these rumors that he's in some sort of major production, um, I believe it. I believe it because there's just too much money on the table for him to just leave it there. 
yeah so two points to that there was images of him in hollywood um at the at one of the landmarks uh just outside of la there um some black and white photos came up recently this week and also there was uh communication with tony khan about wyndham bray wyatt and he apparently said out loud that they had not been in contact with him. Now, you don't know how much you believe on that because I'm pretty sure bringing in Bray Wyatt to AEW is making him probably the most over you could make. Look how over Alistair when he when he came when he came in was. You bring in Bray, who was literally could have been a title contender not eight months ago and possibly main eventing WrestleMania should have been main eventing WrestleMania in my mind, but why would you not ring of honor? Okay. Ring of honor can't afford them. Well, yeah, they don't even ex exist. <laughs> Impact too small, right? That's for me. Impact's too small. You're only going to AEW. And if Tony Khan says he's not talked to him, Tony Khan's not one to come out and really bullshit us, right? He basically says, even with the CM Punk thing, he couldn't even keep the secret. No, yeah, if anything, he talks too much. Yeah, Tony Khan talks too much, and he really doesn't bullshit. So if he's not, if he has basically said, I've not talked to him, I'm taking Tony Khan's word for it. And Bray Wyatt, we're not going to see in a wrestling ring in a very long time. Can't wait to watch whatever shitty movie he comes out with. There's a 0% chance it's going to be good, whatever it is. Just like The Rock rapping? It's about pride. It's about power. We stay hungry. We devour. All right. Let's transition out of that horrible rap song. Uh, and honestly, I miss an opportunity at a great transition because we we were just talking about this, but we were talking about the WWE superstar releases. We have a question from over on our Discord. I'm sorry. I didn't write down who this was. This is either clone or Kevlar. It was Kevlar. It was Kevlar. Is what superstar release do you think had the most potential and why? I'll take I'll, I'll take the floor here. Uh, I think it's easy. I think it's Carrie and Cross. Um, I, 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 like, I don't even think it's close. I think like it's either him or Keith Lee. But I still think in terms of potential uh, outlook, you know, 10 years from now, it, I think it's Carrie and Cross. Um, Carrie and Cross had the WWE look. Uh, he had that like brutality that you don't really see in a lot of like heels these days. Like if you think of the heels that we have right now, you think of people, obviously like you've got your S plus players, like your, your Roman reigns, right. And your Bobby Lashley's I'll put up there as well. Um, but like your typical heel is like happy Corbin, right? Um, like the, these are guys that are, they hit soft, right? They don't really have that like nastiness behind them. And I feel like Kerry and cross had that, which is, Something that I feel kind of differentiates the main eventer from that middling player. Yeah. Um, the entrance, which was butchered in the main ross in the main roster, but the entrance, my God, he had that he had a pay-per-view quality entrance about him in, in NXT. The the black and white, the the angel wings, the lip singing, Scarlet Bordeaux. Oh my god, dude. I, be I still believe that he had the best entrance in all of 2020 when he initially yeah. debuted. And it, it was actually somewhat even slightly better with no audience because you kind of just sat there in awe at what was coming out. And, and there was nothing disturbing it. And then the yeah. fall and pray. Yeah. He, he, he had he had it. He had it. And then WWE makes him into a sex slave gimp. And then gets rid of um, what made Sorry. him, yeah, what made him this ominous figure that was almost larger than life in Scarlet Bordeaux. I, I don't get they, it. And then they bury him on Raw as NXT champion to a fucking roll up to Jeff Hardy. What the fuck? <laughs> Sorry, I had to, I had to jump in on that. And it's funny that the points that you just made, Santi, um, I know you haven't listened to it, but I was listening to Bully Ray's podcast three days ago. And the fact that you spoke to the Karrion Cross thing and then just brought up these points, you are echoing what the professionals, we're, we're pretty professional. I, I can say we're pretty professional, <laughs> but the, what the professionals are saying they, he had the gimmick. He had the look. He, he, it was even said that this is a Vince McMahon guy. 
So it makes no sense. And what you're saying about the best entrance, when he came out to that fall in Prey, do you remember when Bray came out as the Fiend the first time? I was and there. You just sat I was there. there. SummerSlam. I saw it live. And you're like, oh my yeah. God, this is dark. Yeah. This is amazing. And I don't know how to feel. It's just awesome. Yeah. Karrion Cross had the exact same thing. WWE. How do you fuck that up so bad? I mean, <laughs> it's simple. You make him lose his champion to um, a very, very old, half his weight, Jeff Hardy, while he's NXT champion. And then you make him wear a fucking skirt and a gimp mask. Yeah. How to ruin gimmicks for dummies. Is that your answer too, by the way? No, uh, it is. But all I will say is I just want to add on the Keith Lee thing. Just remember, not 18 months before his uh, release, he was NXT and North American champion. You put two belts on this man. Then you bring him out at SummerSlam, one-on-one -on -one versus the Beast. And you make the Beast work and take real bumps against this guy who is relatively just an NXT guy. You're virtually putting him over on one of the top four biggest stages of the year. He beat Randy Orton clean on his first night in the main roster. Like, he, he was set up. I don't get it. So, I don't care if he's hard to work with. Randy Orton has been hard to work with in the back. Gone. The, if, if you, if you uh, have read Moxley's, a lot of Moxley stuff from his book, The Shield, at the start, were hard to work with and said no to everything. They they wouldn't get put wouldn't put Cena over. They said it makes no sense and they stood by it. Hell, there's so many talent that have been hard to work with. If you're saying you released Keith Lee because he was difficult to work with? Yeah. No, that's the that's what you put on on termination papers with like that's what HR would put in, right? Like there's that, that's just I feel like that's just the moniker for they don't want to work with you or or you're not difficult to work with. Like that's subjective as well. Maybe he isn't difficult to work with. Maybe he just doesn't align with the shitty ideas that WWE creative had for him. Does that make him smart to a lot of people? Sure. But to them, it's difficult to work with. Right. Like they control the narrative. So I, anytime I hear this difficult to work with. I, like I put it up there with uh, such a cliche WWE line uh, along the lines of like, we wish them the best in their future endeavors. Like it doesn't mean anything to me. Like it, it, to me, it's just a Fugazi, right? Like it's not real, yeah. right? To, to me, it's just, it's just words on a sheet of paper. Words on a sheet of paper, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't buy that. It seems like everyone that they release in some way, shape, or form, with apparently the exception of Daniel Bryan, um, because they didn't release him, um, they're all of a sudden difficult to work with. It's just, it, it, yeah, it, you know, you, you know, you control the narrative. They control the history. They, they, they're, they're, you know, they're the A card and the billing and the, the, the contracted worker. They they're they're at the bottom in terms of like being able to voice their um, voice their truth. Jesus, fuck. Sorry, uh, Charlotte is difficult to work with currently. Yeah, yeah. Are we gonna see Charlotte Flair's name on a release paper in the next month? Absolutely not. She's legacy. Yeah. She runs the back room. There is the only way she does get released is if she doesn't show up to work. Mm. So. It makes no sense, but yes, I agree with you. Karrion Cross, definitely number one. Keith Lee, very low number two. Steve, were you aware that Survivor Series is in like a week? Because I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> that means the end of, end of 2021 is <laughs> almost around the corner. <laughs> Where the fuck did Survivor Series come from? Uh, did you see the awful teams that WWE put together on a whim on Twitter? Yeah, and they're trying to backpedal now and make a storyline out of it, like you saw on Raw with Dominic Mysterio, Adam Pearce, and returning Bobby Lashley. So, yeah, that was, yeah. Correct. On. You know what's crazy? 
the majority of the Raw team on both the women's and men's side three weeks ago were on the SmackDown roster. <laughs> yep, 100%. And the majority I... of the Raw team three weeks ago was on the SmackDown roster. It's yeah. almost as if they should have just done this before last, the draft last month <laughs> I, it doesn't it's like what it, it's you know you know what it's like they for they put all their money and all their eggs into their into their shitty saudi arabia shows that they forgot they had one of the big four coming up that's I, what it I, feels like i actually think that <laughs> might have been what happened because there's nothing that explains how poorly this has been put together it Tell me in any other year how a team has been put together so poorly. Oh, we've got our marketing guy and our social media guy sitting here just wondering who they're going to put on a team and almost picking names from a hat of the top eight superstars on each brand. Dude, it's almost like I feel like WWE 2K20 could make a better random Survivor Series card than than wwe themselves which brings us to our next viewer question finally i have a good transition into a viewer question and this one comes from claude who says with survivor series coming up what is your dream survivor series men's and women's team and steve my understanding is that you butchered this question and you ended up making an entire survivor series card which is not what the question asked so i yeah i completely read the question wrong so i thought the question was a, uh, make a 5v5 match men's and women's so clone i absolutely hate you for this because i went through uh decades i went with <laughs> teams that could be that could be gelled together just because of their styles stylistically how long did you spend on this i spent like a good hour and a half on I, making i spent teams. two minutes like i like look at this like look at all this right here I, this is all this is all teams i spent two this minutes steve okay so I'll start with my or my men's or sorry, my women's match. So I went with um for my first team, I went with uh Trish Stratus, the man Becky Lynch, not this version or the NXT version. I want the man Becky Lynch. Um Sasha Banks, Charlotte and Lita is on my first team. Now, I went a little differently on this and I went with like a different version of a women's side, not like the greatest of all time. I went with like really strippy gimmicks and like the psychopaths of the women's division that we've seen in WWE. So you have AJ Lee the, on there. I went with Alexa Bliss. I went with Scary Sherry. I went with Luna Vachon, China, hmm. and AJ Lee. I think all around, that is a great Survivor Series match. There's so much storytelling in that because you've got like, like the, you could say a, a Mount Rushmore of the women's division current of the, like the last 25, 30 years. And then you've got all the crazies that just couldn't get to that status. You know what I mean? Sure. So I think that was it. That's a great that's a great little dynamic for storytelling and building up to Survivor Series. Sure. Um, Let me I'll tell my, you my women's team. I'll tell you my women's okay. team real quick, because I, I did not put in that much effort. And yet I still came up with the exact same team as you did. Trish, Lita, Becky, Sasha, Charlotte are are literally the team. They're yeah. the team. I that's yeah, the Avengers. Absolutely. That's the Avengers of women's wrestling. Like, unfortunately, women's wrestling doesn't really have that strong of a legacy. Uh, yeah. Sure, you can go back to Fabulous Moolah and, and whatnot. But like, even then, like they were such a sideshow compared to the men. And now, I mean, now you've got women main eventing WrestleMania night one, for goodness sake. And not even just WrestleMania night one, uh, an entire WrestleMania in Mania, th was it 35 or 30? I don't know, I've lost count. Uh, they don't even number their WrestleManias anymore. That Why the hell should we? Um, <laughs> so because the legacy of women's wrestling isn't very long, it, it really starts with Lita and Trish. And then from there, I mean, sure, you can sort of start to pick and choose and, and move in the likes of Bailey and Alexa bliss in there kind of pick and choose whoever, you know, the flavor of the month is. Um, mm -hmm. but like, that's kind of it there. I don't think that there's that many options. And if you put Ronda Rousey on there, then you're just a fucking loser. 
Yeah, and honestly, I think there's a lot of storytelling. Like, say we could bring Trish and Lita back, you could build to WrestleMania with those five women to a triple threat main event or something like that. And just as Steve, much as I we're hate... not booking here. What are <laughs> your teams? All right. This isn't, we're Sorry. not building to WrestleMania here. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So after survivor series, there's going to be dissension. Then Lita is going to eliminate Trish at the rumble, setting up a potential match at, uh, at fast lane. Like no, Steve survivor series team, read the fucking question. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me go into my men. Let, or do you want to do your men's one first, or am I going to do the men's one first? I'll do I've my, got the. Whole, okay. I'll, go I'll do. I'll do my men's one first. I love my answer. I. I went a different route. I didn't go with like, hey, let's look at the Mount Rushmore. Let's look at the greatest. Re no, I went with people who were all working at the exact same time, on the exact same brand, in the exact same division. Stealing the show. I went with the SmackDown 6 minus 1. I went with Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero, Chavo Guerrero, Edge, and Rey Mysterio to represent SmackDown circa 2003. And tell me that doesn't steal the damn show. It does. It, that does steal the show. They but stole like the I show said. every pay-per-view for that entire year. Yeah, and it, honestly, like, you have different genres but you also have like eddie could fit in any mix like you could put him about against a beast you can put him against a lucha you could put him against a worker and everything's gonna mesh so yes i agree that that is a phenomenal team but i went like i said in a different direction i went with sorry what where, where does the build-up start in yours does it start at backlash and kind of slowly build towards survivor series how does how does your entire build work to this i'm just kidding what's your team? Past, past versus present <laughs> um so i've got austin rock american badass taker brock lesnar and eddie guerrero on team one versus aj burn it down seth rollins kevin owens ambrose and champa Reason being, stylistically, again, you can compare each guy against each guy. Like, Ambrose could go against any of them, especially American Badass Taker. And you obviously saw on the podcast how much tension there was between Austin and Ambrose. So, yeah, that those are the two teams I went against. I think that's a great Survivor Series. There's so much storytelling. I went as a booker. I'm sorry. I went read the question wrong. Let's move on. <laughs> oh man what has happened to survivor series man seriously like it's not i think can we all agree like it's a sham to call it part of the big four i yeah. think at this point money in the bank is more part of the big four than yeah. than than survivor series um i i feel like wwe keeps trying to shove crown jewel down our throat and people just are not biting it's like sorry wwe like like to me and, and this this won't resonate with you, Steve, but this will resonate to anybody that watches anime. To me, anything that happens in the Saudi Arabia shows is like a side story. It's not canon. It doesn't count. It never happened because you're just going to come back to Monday Night Raw and retcon it all. All right. Like when The Fiend lost the title to Goldberg. We retconned that shit real quick and took the title off of Goldberg. All right. The, the, what happens in Saudi Arabia does not matter. When WWE puts on these vignettes about like the Royal Rumble, like the most eliminations, and they put Braun Strowman in at like 20 because he had that like eight, he was in that 80 person Royal Rumble. In the, no. And when they say Daniel Bryan has lasted the longest in a Royal Rumble at 90 minutes, no, that's it's it's Rey Mysterio at 62 because that was a real Royal Rumble that people actually cared about. Anyways, I digress. I hate the Saudi Arabia shows. They're a fucking sham. And they like slavery and, and abusing human rights. <laughs> no, I, I like I, I agree completely with you. I hate the Saudi shows. This year's this one that just passed is the only one that I have ever watched. And I turned it off halfway through. Um, I don't care how many fireworks you put in a show. It's not going to make it any better. It's not going to uh, make it any better until you let the women wear what they want to wear. Their proper ring gear, not these like over baggy ass shirts, pajamas that they force them to wear. 
exactly. Um, I do agree with you. You took the words right out of my mouth with Money in the Bank. I look forward to Money in the Bank more than I do Survivor Series. The Just remember, think about it, 1992, the Million Dollar Man introducing The Undertaker as the secret partner. And those matches were amazing, you know, like... Fuck even the McMahon Helmsley era with their team and everything. Oh my Dude, god! Dude, as re that you can you can look recently. SmackDown NXT versus Raw. How amazing was that's the last like amazing Survivor Series. And it won't. I don't think you could story tell that because you didn't. You were paying attention to Raw. You were trying to figure out how to get NXT if you didn't have the network. Like you were like all over the place. And then like that that last NXT going into survivor series and you had the full triple invasion you're like oh, oh it's so and, good and then the women's event with becky becoming the man with the broken face with naya that's booking that's storytelling what happened yeah that was also when we got the amazing brock lesnar daniel bryan match dude like it was just like oh, so good so good uh and now you know all you have to do is follow wwe on twitter Anyways, we've got one more go. question before there we get into Clown, topic of the show. <laughs> we, have a, we have one more question before we jump here into topic of the show. This is a quick one. So somebody pointed out, we've got Kevlar pointing out that, um, you know, we talked quite a bit about Jericho in the la last podcast. Um, and I said that Jericho is the greatest gimmick worker of all time. I stand by that statement. And he asked us, what is our favorite Chris Jericho? Chris, do you have a favorite Chris Jericho? There's a lot. There's the Ayatollah of rock and roll. There's I White only, 2J. I could, I could only get two. I could only. I, I could only get bring it bring it down to two. Um, and it's his original Y2J. Uh, just because how badly he trolled Stephanie McMahon. That's so good. Week in and week out, it was so good. Even that didn't he have a little stutter? with that one as well Dude, like, well that's the thing like the 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 hilariousness of why to jerry chris jericho in that like early 2000s phase it felt like a fan got the mic yeah. that that's what it, was so beautiful about early 2000s so y to j like w what would happen if you picked up the mic as a fan and you try to interrupt the rock the rock would own you but yeah. but but he was loved because it just felt so real and it was so funny his facial yeah. reactions to every promo that he did were masterful were yeah. masterful especially his stuff leading up to uh like the undisputed title um with rock and and austin because you never thought in a million years he was gonna win that like it so, was gonna I'm be rock sorry, rock. Did he, was he the first uh undisputed champion to ever beat the rock and stone cold on the same night i hadn't heard that before <laughs> but yeah so yes that one and the list of jericho you like I'm the list sorry but again like you said if a fan was writing creative <laughs> This is what <laughs> you'd get. Yeah. Well, how simple. Give give Chris Jericho a clipboard and let him speak. just let him just just let him be him. The amount of guys that broke character because of that damn list was amazing. I remember there was actually it was a Survivor Series. It was the face off between Raw and SmackDown, and it's him and Kevin Owens is the best friend gimmick, and Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt both break character and laugh it's so good and two i couldn't pick it's one or the other you guys mm. can pick for me go See, ahead that's Which interesting one? i'm going a, a different direction uh i one of my favorites is uh i am the best in the world at what i do the slow methodical chris jericho i even stole one of his lines which I say all the time on my stream, which is, do you understand what I am saying to you? I love that Chris Jericho, man. It's such a douchey character. It's such, a, it, and it's such a pivot too. This is what I mean by Chris Jericho is the greatest gimmick worker of all time. He just went from being like the rock and roll. Actually, he was just a little bit removed from rock and roll Chris Jericho. He was like uh, highlight reel Chris Jericho more so now. Mm. Um, like when John Cena was champion and he had that feud with John Cena but it's still such a massive diversion yeah. from like 
from anything that he'd done before and he killed it i still think that one of the best feuds in the in the aughts era is that chris jericho the best in the world at what i do versus Shawn michaels I, like you want to talk about long-term storytelling that was it masterful um that's I would say that in terms of like if I'm talking like seriousness, like the man that, you know, like the Jericho that's going to hold the title. It's that one. Yeah. I'm going to go to a more recent one. The popping bubbly Le Champion of AEW. <laughs> Best friends with Sammy Guevara. <laughs> Chris Jericho, like it, just the fact that the man w that that character was so over that the like the entirety of the AEW audience can just sing his entire theme song, which is not a simple theme song. It's not just a Kurt Angle, you suck. No, this is full chorus yeah. and, and, and just lyrics from beginning to end. That's how over this man was. That One of his, one of the, the trials of Jericho against MJF was literally you nothing to do with judas you can't use judas effect yeah can't come out to the song judas it, yeah. that's that's that to me is one hilarious it's so funny that the song is as over as as a finishing move yeah. oh, <laughs> but, and the funniest part sorry i don't mean to cut yeah, you off but the, the funniest part about that is again we we kind of shit all over aw about not being creative but to put that stipulation in a week in advance where fans wrote the entire five thing, five posters of the lyrics for this. And would you believe that the announcer almost ruined it? One of the greatest spots in AEW history. I'm sorry, I will go there. The short history of AEW. That is still one of the greatest spots. And the announcer, and you get to see Jericho going like this. Shut the f up. Let them do it. Yeah. And that was brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. He is so over what he's even what he's doing like two weeks ago with Paige Van. No, last week with Paige Van Zandt. Oh, it's 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 old school. Oh, that's old school Jericho just roasting the shit out of her. Yeah, it was great. And I agree with you. That is there are so many we can pick so oh, many. There's so many. There's, there's at least so 20. You can talk about like Lionheart, uh yeah. Chris Jericho. If you want to talk about him in Mexico, El El Corazon del Leon, like he likes to call yeah. himself. Like there's so many. Ayatollah of Rock and Rolla, Chris Jericho. Yeah. Uh Dude, the man is is a chameleon. Uh, fucking whatever weird like mime thing he was in in New Japan. New Japan, yeah. Right. So I stand by the statement that he is the greatest gimmick worker of all time. I don't think there's a better one. I don't think there's ever going to be a better gimmick worker than Chris Jericho. But I do think that it's time for topic of the show. Are you ready yes, for this? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Steve. Our topic yeah. of the show, as we told people last week, is we're going to talk about the greatest factions in professional wrestling history. But now, before Santee, we do that, what, okay, okay, go no, ahead. no, no, you're Santee, about to ask what, it. Yeah, Santi, what is a faction? How do we decide what a faction is? That's a great question. Let me just put it as simply as possible. Steve, Edge and Christian, is that a faction? Nope, a tag team. Is the Brood a faction? The Brood is definitely a faction. There we go. I think it's as simple as we need three or more in there. But here's the thing. The Dudley boys, is that a faction? No. But when it includes Spike, it's I still don't see it as a faction. No. So I, it, it, so that okay. So I was gonna I'm purposely contradicting myself. So it can't just be a definition of three. No. It it has to be drawn out as a a collective group, I would say. A collective group that is all together a part like everyone has an equal part i believe for me mm -hmm. spike was not an equal he was like a liaison or a manager for a tag team yeah yeah you know like scary sherry for you know Shawn michaels you know so here's the thing what about the hardy boys and lita no i see i agree i agree so here is my thought process of what a faction is I believe that a faction is a group of individuals that have come together for a similar cause that also have their own individual agendas. They're chasing individual titles. They have their own individual storylines. Let me give you an example. Very recent one that we can talk about. The New Day, 
right? That's a, that's a perfect example of a faction because they are together for a collective cause. But at any moment, Kofi will go out and try and challenge for the championship. Biggie, same thing. Um, I would say that it is like a fast and loose definition because it's still kind of subjective. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, I think we need it to be three or more characters and i do think that there needs to be a semblance of individuality for each individual in the group mm -hmm. so no nope. what do you think of that no nope, absolutely agreed uh the way you stated that i think we should call up webster's and put it in there yeah and here's because of that definition here's why i'm going to eliminate one that i love i am i love this faction but it's it's not a faction because they never had their own individual their own individual like ambitions they were a group a collective group and by god they turned the worst gimmick of all time into one of my favorite tag teams of all time steve are you ready to vomit sure mickey mikey and we are the spirit, the spirit squad <laughs> <laughs> i love the spirit squad man i hated the spirit squad so oh, much. so did everybody but I don't think that's a faction because they were all a collective group, but they never had this like individuality about them only think, until they broke up. Right. I think everybody on the internet is going to disagree with you because <laughs> doing my research for this, they do come up on every single website as a <laughs> faction. So, but no, I, I agree. They didn't have any sense of collectiveness they just dressed the same and they didn't have any kind of outsourcing of wanting to get a title for themselves or personal growth like they didn't want to work off each other yeah i agree i hated them i don't count them as a faction let's 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 actually get in to some factions now <laughs> how about we get remove certain factions before we really talk about the big boys okay okay so santi are we gonna talk about the bwo today no are we gonna talk about the mexicools as much as we want to as much as i would love <laughs> to talk about the walking stereotypes excuse, excuse me not walking riding on lawnmower stereotypes no we're not gonna be talking about the mexicools uh fbi can we talk about fbi i love fbi I loved FBI. FBI is one of my favorite factions. It's not a best faction of all time, but what no. they, oh my God, dude, the, the, if you go back to 2003, 2004 SmackDown, the FBI were gold, gold. For those oh, yeah. that don't remember the FBI, the FBI is the full-blooded Italians. Am I going to be able to name you everybody on them? No, it, but it was Nunzio. It yeah. was giuseppe i don't, I don't even hold, know hold on hold on i think i got it here I, I think i got it here for you quickly uh we've got uh <laughs> little guido tracy smothers yeah so little and, guido is nunzio yeah and tracy smothers are the only two that i've got right now <laughs> oh yeah that's the only two i got right now I Tommy love the Rich, full blood. Little Guido, and that's it yeah i, I love the full blood no we're not going to be talking about the full-blooded italians can I throw a couple of interesting ones at you? I'd like sure. to hear. So I'm going to move away from WWE with this one. This is the one of the factions that got me to believe for a split second that there's something in TNA. And that is Team Canada. That is not I know that's action. Not, I know. I thought I you know. were going to. No, there's better in TNA. What do you what? think of Team Canada? Uh, Bobby Roode. Storm. Okay, Anyways, and you know, the beauty of the Canadian destroyer was born in Team Canada. Do you remember Team Canada? I do remember Team Canada, <laughs> and I will say Team Canada was just as bad in my mind <laughs> as the gimmick of La Resistance, the Heart Dynasty, and every the other heart kind of dynasty. No, I said the Heart Dynasty. I oh, did not, not the, foundation. the Heart okay. Foundation. Okay, 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 okay. I said the Heart Dynasty. I'm talking Natalia, Tyson Kidd, yeah, yeah, yeah. and davy boy's son so we're not talking uh, about team canada today is what you're saying we are definitely not talking about team canada today if you want to come back around to me and talk about the aces and eights okay so let's 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 stay there for a quick second okay i'm gonna i'm i love the aces and eights 
Yes. So tell me, if you had to choose, who would you go for? The Aces and Nates or the main event mafia out of TNA? Okay, so this was like my peak for TNA. I was actually watching Spike for this storyline. Um and just slightly before when they're trying to recruit AJ. Um I'm going with Aces and Eights just because they were more they were a stronger, bigger faction that was still all around to kind of protect Bully and his title run. That's what I loved about it. It was a biker gang. You really got that idea of collectiveness. Um when you looked at the I again, I love the main event mafia, but really all I saw was X champions if can i is did i explain that well enough yeah to... so the reason i like the the concept of the main event mafia it's because it's a it's literally the the idea is a group of guys holding back young talent yeah because like they are literally the mafia that is holding the main event hostage so mm -hmm. you had sting Kurt angle who at the time held like a thousand belts yep. all right you had kevin nash Booker T just coming off of like a hot King Booker run too, uh, and Scott Steiner. And and, Samoa Joe. And, yeah. And eventually adding Samoa Joe, uh, to me, like in terms of raw names, and I'm not saying in terms of legacy, in terms of raw names, if we are just boiling it down to the people in the faction, this would be the best faction of all time. Just names. I'm not saying execution of the faction. The people in this. Let me read it again. Sting, Kurt Angle, Kevin Nash, Booker T, Scott Steiner, Samoa Joe. What? Maybe the NWO has, has a case in terms of like name recognition and, and individual pedigree. As a faction, I don't think that they're the best faction of all time. I'm saying as a collective group, if we're just looking at the pieces of the puzzle, this would be, I think, the greatest faction of all time. Now, here's where I'll, I'll, I'll go against that. Like, yes, your statement is true. Collectively, with honors, what they had at that time was phenomenal. And I, I agree with everything you said. The only thing I would turn that on is to say, if we look back in 20 years not at what the faction was then but who was in it and then what they've done after that i think evolution can have a shout for mm. you know the names in the group the title holders in the group and what they did did after the faction disbanded you've got rick flair 16 time Triple H, 14 times. I think it's Randy, 13 or 14, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Randy, potentially a future 16 time. And then you've got Dave Batista, who is just a, a synonymous name in himself. So you can go both ways and say what TNA had was history brought together. After what Evolution did, history was made after. Mm, you know what I mean? Yeah. So... It's almost like um, this is the first good point you've ever made in any of our podcasts. Anyways, um, but this is this is where I wanted to move into actually kind of talking about how the factions have grown. I agree with you. Like when it comes when it comes to the main event mafia in WWE, if we ever were able to get graced with the main event mafia that storyline could have run two to three years and and sold the merch and run the run every single belt you would have had every single belt on each one of those guys and that nothing could have been done no one could yeah. touch them yeah let's let's talk evolution um because i think that there's there's a lot there um so how into wwe were you at the time when when i was still okay. watching all right yeah okay that's what I wanted to, to double check because this is kind of like prime WWE time for me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember the formation of evolution. I remember the disbanding of it. I remember triple H just 
oh my god just destroying the entirety of the main event scene because he refused to put the belt on anybody else um it looking back it look it, it actually works really well with his character but at the time my god it was a drag to watch oh, yeah. triple h beat everybody that, that was hot coming from wcw um mm-hmm. but i think you made a really good point and i think this is all we can go into the shield but i think this is what also is going to make the shield an amazing faction i believe that evolution is such an amazing faction for what the guys did after right for what the guys did after but of course they wouldn't have been able to do the things that they did after if they weren't set up in evolution batista was you know he um he doesn't win the royal rumble like it just it doesn't happen all right rand and and it, it that the randy orton and batista main event push happened in the same year because in the first half of the year it was randy orton him winning him uh title contenders match against Benoit and then excuse me, winning the number one contenders and then going to SummerSlam and beating Benoit. I believe that triple H was busy that SummerSlam going up against Eugene. I might have the wrong SummerSlam. I might have. Can you double check that while I talk? I think I might have the right SummerSlam because that's hilarious. If one of his people was winning the, the, the world heavyweight champion was while he was busy in a terrible storyline with a mentally handicapped Eugene. If I if I'm right, I have an amazing brain for pay per views. But uh, 2004, Eugene versus Triple H, and that SummerSlam. that would have been, oh that would have been the year that Randy won 2004 uh, SummerSlam. I'm I'm pulling it up. Keep going, keep going. Anyways, um, it, it, both their main event pushes happened in the same year, and then what they went on to do in that very next year with Randy Orton challenging for the streak with Batista winning the world heavyweight championship from triple H. Like the, the, the fact that the faction imploded within itself yeah. for the gold, for the gold, right? Yeah. It wasn't for something petty. It was for the gold. It just showed that like these guys were, were personalities that were greedy that were, um, that were out for themselves that were yeah. willing to put that aside for a little bit to be together. But when the gold was put in between them, it imploded everything, and I love that. I and absolutely you were, love you, that. You were spot on. It was Benoit <laughs> uh, Orton for the title, and it was JBL Taker for the yeah. other main event. So well done. I'm Thank you. very, Thank you. <laughs> very, 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 very impressed. And yeah, and that's and and it's kind of funny because we we have we have seen a very similar faction um, like Evolution that I, I don't want to pull away from WWE too far, but. I'm going back into like my generation at my very young age. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I was not a big WCW guy, but th- the real talent pool that was in uh, the Dangerous Alliance. Oh, so we're looking Paul E. Dangerously, who is now Paul Amon. We're looking at sorry, I wrote down the original members here just to get full like concept. You had who became Ravishing Rick Rude. You had Bobby Eaton. You had Arn Anderson, Larry Zabisco, and Medusa all in this faction. And then they added a real small unknown character at the time who became the largest character ever in wrestling in stunning Steve Austin. Again, if we're going to talk about a faction... Are we talking about what they did then or who they became? Yeah. And- yeah. I don't know. I, I I just don't think that with the difference with evolution, I, I believe that Brandy and Batista became what they became because they were because because of the faction, because of yeah. evolution. I don't think that of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like if I think of Stone Cold Steve Austin, I don't think, oh, like, thank goodness. He was in that faction beforehand. Otherwise, we would have never had Stone Cold Steve. He wouldn't have be. I I just don't make that connection the same way that I do with Randy Orton and Batista. I think every WWE documentary goes back to that. That is about Randy Orton and Batista goes back to that moment. I don't okay. think that a Stone Cold documentary goes back to that saying like citing as that's the inciting incident that created Stone Cold Steve Austin. Okay, hear me out. Randy and Batista rode in the same car as Triple H and Ric Flair gaining knowledge day in and day out, right? You put 
Stone Cold Steve Austin in a car with Paul Heyman. Day in and day out, learning from Paul Heyman. Does Stone Cold find that character, which we finally saw, what, three or four years later? Yeah, but Steve, now you're diving into reality. You're moving away from the okay. character in the faction because the character in the faction wasn't a, an understudy of Paul Heyman, right? Like the there. real, the real Austin probably was. He was probably enamored with how what a brilliant wrestling mind Paul Heyman was, but mm -hmm. like the character wasn't. Meanwhile, in Evolution, the character tropes of Batista and Randy Orton was that they were the proteges. There. Okay. They were the protege. So I, I still, I, I got to disagree. I just don't see that, that inciting moment, that inciting incident within the faction that created Stone Cold Steve Austin. Okay, cool. No, I just, I was just looking, when I was looking at like all the factions that we could talk about today, it was very interesting seeing those big names from a faction that's pretty much forgotten about mm -hmm. at this time. And then you look how it kind of developed and who the people became. You know what I mean? So that's how I went through this whole this whole thought process. So so Steve, I know I I I wasn't planning on ranking these, but like maybe let's do a quick recap of who we've talked about. All right? Okay. So I think we can both agree that the Spirit Squad is at the top. Team Canada is second. I'm just kidding. Yep, um, yep. Okay, so we've talked about Aces and Eights. We've talked about the main event Mafia. We've talked about um Evolution and we've talked about excuse me, what was the name of your faction? Uh, 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 dangerous alliance. Dangerous alliance. Um, am I missing any that we've talked about so far? Like no. seriously talked about? Okay. No. Are we in agreement that out of those four, evolution is number one so far? So far, okay. number one. Okay. Because yes. I, 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 what I want to do is now compare other factions that we're going to talk to to like what is the number one right now, which is evolution, and seeing like if we remove evolution from that. From that top ranking, from that top billing. Do you know what I mean? No, no. I, okay. I like I like the idea on it. Uh, I don't see Evolution staying there sure. long. Sure. But I do agree with you out of everyone we have talked about in depth, Evolution is clearly the front runner. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to give a, um, a controversial opinion here on okay. a faction. I think DX is overrated. But you can't take them away from what they've done for the business i agree i still think evolution is better no they dx did so much to really incite what was the attitude era and really dx started or no sorry dx didn't start they retaliated to the monday night war which really then brought everyone back to wrestling Alundra Blaze or Medusa or whatever the hell you want to call her, dropping the title in the bin was really the first of many shots by Eric Bischoff and WCW. Scott Hall, Kevin Nash coming over with the Outsiders. That was great. But DX and WWE basically said, okay, it wasn't Scott Hall saying you want a war. It's WWE finally saying, okay, we will acknowledge you and we will have a war. If you want a war, we're going to bring it to you and we are going to kill you and take your business. And that is what they did. And if it wasn't for DX and their antics and all everything they did, we don't get the attitude area. We don't get that war. So DX, the DX we know in the late 2010s, like 2015, that was trash. But late 90s DX... That was perfect. Perfect for, sorry, they're not overrated. DX is definitely <laughs> up there and they're ahead of evolution. Ahead of evolution. A faction that has the most, I, I gotta imagine, the most world titles out of a faction. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, maybe for, for me, it was the like I, I wasn't a huge fan of the antics. Um, okay. I wasn't a huge fan of um, like I, I never took when they were DX. Mm -hmm. I never took them seriously. When you pulled out Hunter and he was on his own, I took him seriously. Mm -hmm. When I put him in evolution, I took him seriously. I, I just I could never separate the character, the goofy Triple H um 
I, I just I couldn't separate it from from I guess from like the bigger picture and what they were doing within yeah. the business. It just like to me, even as a kid, I was just like, oh, my God, can I please just go back to the rock? Can I please go back to Stone Cold? Like, I get it. Like they were like a big portion they were a portion of the Monday Night War. They, but like, if if Stone Cold is an M16 and The Rock is is an AK47, like, I feel like DX in that in in that arsenal is like a handgun. Like, I just don't think that they even match up in terms of obviously. Like, I, we're we're diverging, right? Like, because I'm I'm yep. comparing DX to the two potentially greatest, most famous valuable superstars in wwe history um but like as a kid i was i just could never get invested yeah. in what dx was doing the only thing i will say is like you said okay most titles out of evolution but then you also have to look at dx and the people that they had in there and you have to think of even just two of them or three because you can't get, uh get rid of the new age outlaws like you have to and china as well look at some of the biggest moments that were created not just in that faction but by the people in that faction you know what i mean hunter has so many wrestlemania moments sean is mr wrestlemania up until god i can't even think of a tag team that can really compare to being so over the, the hardys the hardys and edge and christian the outlaws were it for the longest time and they ran, they they kept that division afloat. And then China being the first dominant, dominant female to actually wrestle and do like what the men could do, joining the Rumble, et cetera, et cetera. You have to think of the moments that DX really brought in and how they carried the business and helped the business. So again, it depends how you balance it. I can see your point on evolution, but for hell if you even want to go to merch sales there's more merch sales at dx okay bar not. all right who killed wcw more evolution or dx dx started it evolution finished it. dude evolution fucking put the stake through their brain every no, I, wc I, I know i know this that was i'm not actually like i just thought it was a funny thing that like yeah. wcw is like I, I, I mean, uh, DX is like thought of as like the ones that took the war to WCW. But like, if you look like six, seven years later after the fact, actually not even, yeah, actually around that, um, yeah. like when WCW stars started to come over and they were just getting plucked one by one, just getting fucking sledgehammer out of the business. Oh man. So are we asking, did DX kill WCW or did Evolution or are we asking if Hunter killed WCW? Yeah, well, I think the answer is Hunter. <laughs> I think definitely the answer is definitely Hunter. Uh, okay, let's move on from 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 DX. And I, I mean, let's put it let's put the conversation into the same era. Uh, I mean, like the yin and the yang heads and tails. You had DX over here. We had the NW over there. The NWO, I feel like, is like a tale of two halves. I think the NW, NWO is garbage beyond the first three members of the NWO. You took my entire conversation. The NWO is actually a plague. It is not a faction because the NWO was so out of control but at one point that you weren't watching WCW Nitro. You were watching the NWO. There was the NWO Black and White. There was the NWO Wolfpack, which I still think is the best version of that mess. There was the LWO. There was the... What other color? <laughs> EWO. There were, there, there were so many WOs. Like, it just... It was hard to Wait, did you say track. Latino World Order yet? I did say oh, okay. LWO. Oh, the LWO, yeah, yeah. So, up until, like, who's the third man, and then that heel turn for Hulk, and that whole part of the NWO, I can say quite confidently that part could be, could be the greatest faction of all time. Could be what they did with it later allowing every member a branded shirt 
like I'm pretty sure like Bischoff was an L NWO member at one point. Like I I got confused. I wasn't there announcers with NWO shirts on. Like it just got so confusing. So what you just stated there was my entire argument with the NWO. Yes, you can put them way up there, but it's not the 300 people all wearing NWO shirts in the back. It is Hall, Nash, Hogan. Done. Yeah, yeah. I would say that out of, you know, you, you want to talk about, you know, you're talking about like the memorable moments that DX has put forward. I don't think that any of the moments that DX uh, put together even comes close to the third man reveal. I would say that that's kind of like, that's in the annals of wrestling encyclopedias right like you it, it, you can you can be born now and 10 years from now when you're 10 years old you are going to run into on you are going to go into a rabbit hole on youtube as a wrestling fan and you're inevitably going to find the third man reveal like that you you're going to like that is something that will never you you will never be forgotten it changed the business. It absolutely did. It absolutely did. It, it removed the this facade. I love to say the word Fugazi, you know, this Fugazi yeah. of like the good guys are always good guys. The the um, say your prayers, eat your vitamins, Hulk Hogan. Nobody, you know, he he's the the the, the you know, the the face of everything good. Right. It can be corrupted. It yes. can be corrupted. Um. So, yeah, I don't think that there is a more impactful moment uh in faction history uh than the third man reveal but i would say that both evolution and dx uh are undeniably better than the nwo if we're just gonna say best factions yeah no i'll, I'll like i said for what they did to change the business and you know how i am and all my arguments are about escalating the business and making the business better the NWO and that third man moment changed. It made 10 Turner money. Yeah. It, and it, it went on the run. If that doesn't happen, nobody gives a shit about WCW outside of Florida. And that's what they needed to do. They needed to become mainstream and be able to break into New York. And mm. that moment did it. So yeah. for what they did to change the business and insightfully potentially start the Monday Night War, well, that was kind of one of the first shots fired because I'm pretty sure the second Hogan came out, everybody watching WWE or WWF at the time, they switched the channel. Yeah, they and, needed to see yeah. what was going on. Of course, the in 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 classic WCW fa fashion, they still managed to ruin it by the stupid announcer. It was it Tony Schiavone? Well, what if it's Hogan? What if Hogan's a third? Shut the fuck up! All right, all right, yeah. just let it happen. It's one of those yeah. moments where like silence is better. All right, yeah. silence is. Be Anyways, I digress. No, I, I, I digress. At, at least we've come to that. At yeah. least we've come to that point. Let's talk more modern era, and I. This is an interesting one, because yeah. this was one of those where they had their inciting moment, their crescendo, had the opportunity to actually revolutionize the business. It okay. didn't, because they ran into a wall called Vince McMahon loves John Cena's money. And that is the Nexus. And I'm talking original Nexus. I'm talking, uh, um, um, oh my God, Barrett. Right, uh wade barrett what, why I bar it. yes all those guys yeah. all those guys making their initial statement and here's here's why i to me is such a memorable moment actually like the the reveal and them coming in and destroying the entirety of the monday night set literally choking justin roberts to the point where like he's dying uh yeah. ripping the mats destroying the ring um to me it was this missing moment for about like five like three years where wwe was starting to get too cartoonish this john cena era right like we've talked about the john cena era at length here but there was this like two three year gap where it's just like man could we get a little bit of fucking attitude here yeah can we please get something new please yeah. stop trying to feed me the miz I love the Miz, but like, this is like, they were trying to push the Miz hard at the time. I don't want to see Alex, right? I want to see some attitude. And we finally got it in the form of 
the new Nexus. No, excuse me, not the new Nexus, the Nexus. Another interesting tidbit is because this was sort of like the forbidden door that was open between that separated WWE and developmental. Yes. Because those guys weren't, the majority of them were not ready to be on the main roster. No, God, no, God, no. They absolutely were not. But we finally got a glimpse because, man, you would hear about FCW. You would hear about OVW. And, yeah. like, you would never know that they were affiliated with WWE. You would never know. You, you know, th- it seemed like an invasion of some sort that we just didn't know. There was no real buildup. It was just they're there. I know. And yeah, it was, it was like, they, who was, like, we had Ryback, David Barrett, Otunga. David Otunga, um, Keith Slater. Yeah, there was like, like the, yeah, I yeah. You're, you're looking at names that you're like, you you heard rumblings of these people. Barrett had a bit of a stint by himself coming in, but there wasn't anything. And then you really got that surprise. And even you looked at like the crowd's faces, and you're like, okay, like this is um, is this supposed to be happening? Where's security? why is everyone running away should we remove ourselves from this situation like it was a good sell and you're completely right the the vince mcmahon draw me money we if you gave that six eight months of good storytelling and good non freddie prince jr uh production you could have had something you could have had had something so much and barrett spoke to that at length with uh again I, it, if I forgot it, episode one, I'm forgetting it now. That English where they do the WCPW. On, that's it. Wade Barrett spoke at length about why the moment that Nexus got buried, um, it was the SummerSlam, I believe, and they they lost to Cena. Yeah, all, right? I think it was. It, it came down to a one v four, and Cena pinned them all. And the reason Vince said that they needed it to happen that way is because he wanted to send the crowd home happy. Did he? I don't think so. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, what I'll say about the Nexus, because I, I, I just wanted to bring them up for conversation's sake, not because I even wanted to put them in any sort of tier alongside who, we, who, who we're arguing are, are, are at the top, which is right now DX and Evolution. But I will yeah. say is that they spark something in me. I know that I've said previously that I came back into wrestling full time when The Rock came back. I came back into wrestling with out of the corner of my eye. Yeah. When the Nexus came because I heard yeah. about it. And like to me, I'll, I'll use a movie quote to tell you how I felt about the Nexus. There at first you had my curiosity. Now mm-hmm. you have my attention. Is yeah. how I felt about like the, this Nexus. Uh, yeah, I, again, I just wanted to talk about it because I feel like it was just such a pivotal moment um, involving a, a, a WWE faction, a recent one too. It's so funny that you say that about your entrance back in, because that I'm pretty sure I can really bring it to a point. I was already fed up of John Cena, Miz, but that Nexus kind of thing was really okay. Like we've got something here. But the second they got buried by Cena, I stopped watching, I can say, probably for a good two years. Mm -hmm. Because nothing, nobody on that card interested me. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the back interested me at that point. It was just John Cena for the kids, and you could see them really getting into the PG era. And it really just was nothing that I was interested in. I grew up in the Attitude Era. I'm one of those guys that, really loves how raw and like grimy AEW is but i'm still a wwe guy but they were lacking that for so long and it was just like that's where my exit was Mm -hmm. for a long time so no i'm glad you brought that point up because it kind of shows our differences like where we're at yeah Um, so yeah let let me uh continue to go down this list because uh well we'll, we're coming here to the home stretch i want to talk about some of the modern um factions here we've talked about some of the oldies some of the goodies but i'm gonna throw some names at you all right Mm -hmm. i want to hear what you think about the undisputed era okay so who they are now as talent 
Um, Kyle O'Reilly, um, I think, does have a very good opportunity to do some damage on the main roster. Um, losing Bobby Fish and Adam Cole in like the span of two months, AEW got hardcore talent that can run for years to come. I loved the Undisputed Era. I really did, but I was not a big NXT guy at the time. Um, most of my conversations and knowledge of NXT was talking to you in the office and you giving me updates, and then I would go and watch kind of the the fillers and get the the rest of the information. But what the what I saw of the Undisputed Era loved them. Mm-hmm. Great heel faction disbanded in a very well created way. And you, you know, you had that one personality that was kind of just a little bit more over than the rest of the guys, but the rest of the guys still had core talent. And no, I, I love the Undisputed Era. What yeah. about yourself? So the, the reason I love the Undisputed Era is because I think they fit the mold of the quintessential faction, right? The group of guys that have come together for a cause, all of which go off to pursue their own personal ambitions. Okay, so we had Adam Cole chasing the NXT championship. We had Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish being just stealing shows with the likes of um, authors of pain um, in the tag team division. And then you had who I feel is the unsung hero of the Undisputed Era, Roderick Strong, just killing it in the mid card of NXT with the likes of at the uh, at the time, um, the Velveteen Dream and Pete Dunne. Just put, they were all putting on slobber knockers in yeah. different divisions, yeah. but they were all still one. And we you know when we try to talk about the definition of what a faction is, I wish I could have just put a picture of the Undisputed Era because I truly believe that that is the definition of a the perfect faction. I, I feel like they should have had a run on the main roster. If we had had the Undisputed Era doing the same thing on the main roster with with Cole going for a main title, Roderick Strong putting on slobber knockers for the US or IC, and Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly stealing shows against the likes of the New Day, the Usos, or the Wyatts, ooh, my God, but we never got it. We never got it, and we never will. So I feel to me, as much as I love the Undisputed Era, I think it's the story of what could have been rather than the story of what was because what could have been, Ooh, I feel like these very, very similar to the new day. This could have been a faction that never broke up. Yeah. Um, I, comp- you, you hit the nail on the head, man. Like what could have been, um, it's another evolution at that point. It's, it's, it's guys going for their individual stuff, but still rooting the back and the front, making good television, merch sales, all that kind of thing, good storytelling, incredible matches. Like that War Games. Oh my. Sorry, you didn't God. say it right. War Games. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, that was a little bit too Vince. I didn't go regal. <laughs> but yeah. Um, but no, just you're right. You're right. The, and they're, I, I think Bobby Fish and. Adam Cole are really going to do some damage. I saw the little clip tonight of uh, what they're kind of leading into with AEW. So they're going to do really well. And uh, rumors of Kyle O'Reilly uh, being on SmackDown on a dark uh, dark match with uh, Johnny Gargano last week. They, maybe they'll do great things as individuals, but as that faction could have been top three best of all times and i i that's a strong shout from me because mm-hmm. i already have my top three and that's i would put them really close i want to hit you with another one now here's where i feel like we we, we should end the podcast i'm gonna and we're gonna talk about this faction and then i'm gonna hit you with a rapid fire group of three that i think will be linked together for the rest of time what do you think an honest opinion of the bullet club Oh God. Um, okay. You want me to start? No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a way. Okay. Go ahead and start, but I need, there's one way I need to put this and I need to get the right words. So go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put it simply to me, the, the bullet club, 
is is a farm where WWE and other organizations just kept plucking guys out of. So I never really got that true continuity of that leader, right? We had Prince Devitt bringing Bullet Club like into existence. He gets plucked out. All right, where do we go from here? AJ Styles gets plucked out. Then we have Kenny Omega goes off and does his own thing with uh, with with the Elite. Now, I mean, you can make the argument that the Elite is like the spiritual successor to the Bullet Club. We're not going to go there. I don't think that any AEW faction should even be in this conversation yet. Like, they just have not been around long enough to for us to even discuss as much as I love the Inner Circle. Um, but the Bullet Club... I think is this darling of the wrestling community that I feel people are looking too much with rose tinted glasses rather than realizing that like, okay, cool. Yes. We had, we had Gaijin champions out of there, which means foreigners, which is not a common thing in new Japan with the likes of Kenny Omega and, um, and AJ styles. I don't, no, I don't believe that Prince Devitt won their World Heavyweight Championship. I might be wrong there. I might be wrong there. But definitely AJ Styles and definitely Kenny Omega. Um, I just feel that there was never this true sense of continuity there. And never really like a true sense of like followed camaraderie yeah. throughout the years. Uh, I feel like once you were deemed the next WWE guy, you know, you got buried by the Bullet Club. That's just kind of how it worked. Right. And yeah, I mean, I I don't know how to feel about that. I'm not a huge fan of that. And although the, the matches that they would put together in the cool story, they were just fucking cool. Um, but like, to me, it's just like, ah, like this isn't like, you know, like if I'm a part of a basketball team, I don't want to be looking over my shoulder all the time because somebody wants to take my place. Yeah. Um. So I, I think I got it. Like for me, I think the Bullet Club is the biggest financial miss of WWE um vince is all about his merch and what's gonna draw him money and i really do think yes it is an indie based group that us hardcore fans really get drawn to because they kind of created their own big thing and i actually thought aew was somehow gonna run with it when they brought in nick and matt jackson kenny omega i thought there was just gonna be a bullet club takeover into aew right away um which i'm kind of glad they did they went the elite route instead of bringing the bullet club over because the bullet club is still that like indie darling that you can still go back and look at and if you really want to be an indie guy you can look at the rivalry between bullet club and chaos where everyone bullet club has always tried to pull okada right but okada runs chaos so like you're this is me going into way too much new japan stuff but it's kind of like that indie darling that i really hope never gets mainstreamed even though it kind of is but i really just don't want to see like a big financial backer just shove it in your face kind of like what the nwo did in wcw and just everyone is nwo knowing that balor or prince devitt was a leader of the bullet club and he still does those little darling hint touches to it in all of his matches aj the same kenny the same um it's it's that indie darling that I hope never gets ruined. That's my opinion on the Bullet Club. Okay. Let's uh, wrap it up here, Steve. I'm going to hit you with whom I feel really brought back the concept of the faction in, in the last couple of years. The New Day, the Wyatt family, and the Shield. Yep. Three, I mean, had... All three had potential to have been inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame as groups. You know how like they do like, oh, like we're inducting DX. We are inducting the NWO. We are for sure going to get an induction of the New Day one day. Yes. I don't know if we'll get the induction of the Shield. Maybe. Yes, maybe. Yes, maybe. I would, I would like to think so. I would like to think so. Uh, the Wyatt family, we won't. But we had this thing that I would argue we've never had groups this over going against each other regularly. No. 
We've never had that. All in I the same era and all went on to do things that are quintessential faction things. We have the New Day going for world titles and tag team titles and middle mid card titles. We had the Shield going for world title. And this is after the fact. They, they ended up breaking up, but they went for world titles, mid card titles and, and tag team titles. You had the Wyatt family titles, world titles. I don't think they ever had a mid card titles, but you had like the Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt winning world titles. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we see that again happening all at the same time in the same universe. It's, it's kind of like a genera generational thing. Cause I think the only thing that I can really bring it to is when you had the nation versus mm -hmm. the nation of domination, the corporation, uh, the corporate ministry, and you also had like the Hart Foundation that was kind of in there all at the same time in the mid '90s. Those were the only time I think that was the last time you saw three or four standing factions that were over, over. with the over over with the crowd. Right? Um, I'm gonna say this: the Wyatt family is the biggest miss I think of our generation. Um, you had Bray Wyatt who alone his gimmick is world title world title we saw it with with the fiend what he turned into yeah he's a main event he's a main eventer yeah braun intercontinental us whatever title you want to put on him he's big enough he can carry it and then the tag team with harper and rowan weird gimmicks but still over you know um so the wyatt family biggest miss and i think their biggest the reason they failed is because they teased sister abigail way too much and they needed that one female character to really come in at the time of the full faction and they could have run the show um the new day i hated the new day at the start i think everyone that, did i think that was the, i think preacher thing yeah. was like what am I watching and why is it taking you six months to figure this out? And that, that's was... why they're, that's why they're so brilliant though. That's why the new, the new day is the greatest accident that has ever yeah. happened in WWE. I'm serious. Yeah. These guys were okay. So they weren't work. Biggie was in like lower mid card territory. Like he just was doing nothing. He was, yeah. he was uh, Dolph Ziggler's bodyguard for a bit, which is like, doesn't even make sense. Um, you had Xavier Woods just recently coming in from TNA, um, who was also doing nothing. I think, was he part of uh, the Funkasaurus? Like that group? Do you remember that? For a, sh a short I, minute, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, also doing nothing. All he was doing was dancing. And then Kofi, this veteran, who had at that moment in time now been with the company for eight years, never gotten a shot at a world title at that moment in time. Yeah. Um, so you had three Island of Misfit toys sort of situation. Yeah. And they put their heads together and they say, hey, we've got a great idea. Let's go pitch it to Vince. Vince loves it. Turns out this idea is horrible. It's a terrible idea. And yet somehow this terrible idea, they worked into an amazing idea because their attempt at getting like the new day rocks, new day rocks led to the new day sucks chance, yep. which like led to like a, a wonderfully annoying group of preachers that you eventually just have to just, you just had to love. Yeah, so exactly. The New Day is just a beautiful accident. Yeah, and then they brought in that entrance with Big E just literally screaming over a microphone. Yeah. And apparently, apparently I've heard that Vince cracks up every time he did it. It was so good that Vince just said, louder, louder, keep going. And then, oh, honestly, yes, you, you're right. Greatest accident and merch sales they surpassed um who was it not john not john cena they surpassed um oh they surpassed someone that very very t high up uh most recently because of their merch sales with all all the stuff that they have yeah the okay. unicorns the would the you ever wear a shirt <laughs> Yeah, dude, I have a I have a New Day unicorn. Uh, I was at a live show and Kofi Kingston threw his unicorn 
and it was clearly at a, at a little kid behind me, but I fuck all six foot two of me jumped and <laughs> stole it and gave it to my little niece. I wasn't going to let some other kid keep Kofi's unicorn. I have a unicorn from Kofi Kingston, but That's yeah, there's just so much you could buy for the pancake shirts, the, the, um, Budios. yeah, the bootios. <laughs> oh man. Like they're just so good. They're absolutely so, so, so good. Um, yeah. you can make the argument that they're a tag team, not a faction. I disagree. I believe that they are a faction, especially recently going out of their way to go for their own individual ambitions. Um, yeah. let's also, we, you know, we talked a little bit about it earlier, um, with Austin, creed doing his up up down down they've got the new day podcast like they are they've they've transcended beyond just in-ring talent which is not something that we can say for a lot of the performers in in this list with the exception of hunter um who is you know now yeah. this omnipresent uh omnipresent being in wwe uh, yeah. i love the new day i love the new day but i love one faction even more and that is the shield the shield yeah, i'm i'm glad you went there because the shield is your modern day um I, i'll say it's it's your modern day evolution for for what the new genre of the the business is like um what you've seen come out of a faction that came out in black pants and turtlenecks on a that you thought was a they were supposed to come thing. out in ride shields yeah, and they they squashed that, thank God, because that would have buried them right away. Um, the Shield, for me, will go down in this generation as the greatest faction of the modern day. Roman, what he has become finally, finally, after being shoved down our throats for so many years. Seth, I don't know what he's doing dressing like Paddington Bear last week, but okay, whatever. That was horrible. But what he has become and what he will become, and then once Moxley gets better, like he, you, we've got the three biggest names, do we not? Can can we not say right now the three biggest names in the industry are Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, John Moxley? Yes or no? If you disagree, I, I I'm smoking something that I shouldn't be because uh, those yeah. guys, those guys brought back what a faction should be. They had rivalries. They were out for themselves. They had everything. They had everything to be great. And I wish they went a little longer. I don't think it was the right time to break them up when they did. I guess WWE smarter than me, but I, I hated their reunion, not. by the way. Their their last oh, ditch so attempt bad. at a reunion. So uh, so and it sounded like like that last ditch reunion is um was like their last attempt to try and keep Moxley. Um, yeah. under a WWE contract, similarly to like when WWE decided to ki give Cesaro a main event push when his contract was coming up. Uh, it's just like, here, here's some scraps. Um, yeah. I didn't like it. Um, I think that the shield could have been this amazing. They didn't ever need to get back together. The shield, all it needed to be moving forward was a head nod, a head nod across the ring. And that would get pops. Yep. pops well they showed it in that backstage scenario with uh the aj and the good brothers uh and the new day and they were talking about factions and all they did was pan out and the three boys were standing there and they just that's all they needed they just said greatest factions and they just turned and walked away yeah oh no roman goes do you believe that and he goes nah and walked away and that set everyone off like everyone and i even got goosebumps at that point because it was so simple yeah yeah so yeah I'm, I'm of the mind that like you don't all you don't need full reunions when it comes no. to like a group that big you just need that one moment in time when they become like a, an alliance for 30 seconds will go a, a very very long way more yeah. so than like the full reunion trying to get back together um or maybe like someone like a like an avengers moment grouping together to take on you know somebody like i don't know you, you know like what a, I'm rumble, to a quick a quick rumble moment to of try like, and take out Baron, Baron, not Baron Corbin, uh, Braun Strowman. Exactly. Something so like that, right? Or Brock Lesnar. Like I agree. I agree. So, Santi, I'll, I'll ask you right now before we get this all wrapped up. We haven't, we said we weren't going to list them, but give me your top five. Just who's in the top five. Sure. They don't have to be ranked. Go sure. Ahead. In the top five for me, it is Evolution, 
it is the spirit squad i'm just kidding uh it's <laughs> it's uh it's evolution the shield the new day the undisputed era and dx as much as like i'm not a big fan of dx um i can't deny what they did yeah um mine is really quick um i'm going with uh the original nwo uh for what the shield has done for the business now it's the shield uh i will go with um dx i will go with uh the undisputed era and definitely evolution um mine's more stock standard but there's are are some honorable mentions the heart foundation you can look at um what the corporate ministry and the corporation did in the early 2000s um you can talk about the nation of domination and what they did for the rock's career i don't think without the nation there is a rock i think rocky Maivia is floundering in the mid card somehow um i uh, there's so we've missed so many factions today that we could have talked about oh, yeah. i don't think there's enough in our one or two hour podcast to talk about them all and what they've done for the business. But I think those five that we both really said are stock standard. And I hope somebody can come back and argue this because it would be great to maybe revisit this in a couple episodes, maybe in a year's time. Oh, we did this episode one. Who did we miss? What's your opinions? Guys, in the Discord, in the YouTube comments, let us know what you think and we'll get back to you on it and we'll even talk about it even a little bit more. Yeah. Um, again, we need engagement. We need to know people are listening if we want to go beyond the five episodes. Uh, with that being said, we'll mark that as the end of episode three. Steve, what is our topic next week? Um, I'm going to leave that one up to a surprise for next week. Okay. Um, uh, you and I had two written down, but, um, we're going to, we're going to go off the cuff on that one and we'll let everyone know in the discord and in the YouTube when this video is posted. Sounds good to me. Uh, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at twitch.tv slash Mr. Teshk. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Teshk and on Instagram at Mr. Teshk. Santi, what about yourself? Uh, just focus on my Twitch, twitch.tv slash Santi's app. Come on over to the Discord. The link will be down in the description as well. Um, you're, it's more than just a wrestling Discord. We have a large gaming community there as well, but we do have a professional wrestling section uh, in the sidebar. So if you want to leave your questions there or here in the comment section of the YouTube channel, you are more than welcome to do so. Make sure to like the video on your way out, leave a comment, tell a friend about it, tweet it out. I don't know. Just do whatever it is that people do to try and get the word out. I want to do this for more than five episodes. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for listening and have a great night.